Over the next month or so, the United States Supreme Court is going to face several difficult challenges coming in from the states. It's already facing one right now from Pennsylvania. I'm sure there'll be more. No matter which way the Supreme Court handles these cases, no matter what it does, no matter what it decides, the partisan divide in this country is going to be deepened. Half the country is going to be upset and lose faith in the legitimacy, nonpartisanship of the United States Supreme Court. But if it decides poorly in some of these decisions, it could be a major step to propel this country towards civil war. Let me explain why. There are basically four ways the Supreme Court could decide these cases. One, it could just not even address them. Just let the decisions of the state court stand. And there's going to be a lot of pressure on the Supreme Court and temptation to do just that. The second would be to take the cases, but to decide that the state courts were right. The third would be to take the cases, conclude that there was voter fraud, to put it simply, but that it's a moot question at this point. And other than to decree that action should be taken to prevent similar things from happening in the future, nothing else will be done. The fourth possibility is that they make the same decision as they did in the third option, but they take action to provide relief. Now that could be done by throwing out votes if they can determine that. It's possible they won't be able to determine that. If indeed some of the frauds that had been outlined already with sworn affidavits of stamping ballots with the wrong dates, how do you fix that? One option may be to just order a given state, Pennsylvania, Michigan, redo the whole thing under heavy supervision. I really doubt that the Supreme Court's going to want to go that far. So those are their four options. Now, what are the implications of those options? If you look at options one, two, and three, which would bring joy to the supporters of Joe Biden, to the Democrats, you're going to have about half the country really upset because about half the country believes, as do I, that there has been real voter fraud. I was a little suspicious early on, but the more I'm seeing, you know, I, 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 I watched a video of somebody going over, you know, literally the pages on the Michigan suit that's been brought with seven or eight charges, all backed by sworn affidavits. At the minimum to me, this requires an investigation. I want to know, is, is the evidence given in these sworn affidavits sworn under oath, true? And if it's not true, I would like to see these people who swore this false information, perjured themselves, prosecuted. Something needs to be done, either way. But looking at what's been done, looking at the, the video I did the other day on you know, how, how in, in Pennsylvania, you had this surge of enthusiasm for the Democrat ticket, but in all the neighboring states that were solidly blue, or Ohio, which is run by Republicans, you see actual Democrat voter turnout go down while it goes up 15% in Pennsylvania. That seems awfully odd to me. So I am ever more convinced, and as the days go by, I become ever more convinced that there was indeed fraud. And if the Supreme Court does option one, two, or three, and doesn't change anything, the problem for me isn't just that they got away with it, the problem for me is, and the problem for many other Americans is going to be, what faith do we have in the future? Yeah, we lost 2020. I've seen people on TV saying, yeah, we're, you know, it's A, don't play the cards right, we'll get them in 2022. If they can do, if they can get away with what they did in 2020, with Trump in the White House, and an attorney general who's a Republican, and you have a Republican in charge of the Department of Homeland Security, you replace them with Joe Biden, 
and a Democrat as Attorney General and a Democrat at Homeland Security, what chance is this that they won't do it again or on an even grander scale? That's the problem. So not only will they piss off half the country, they'll basically end up convincing half the country to have no faith in elections in the future. And that's really bad. If they follow option four and actually do something, then the people on the left are going to be upset. So again, no matter what they do, you're going to have a situation in this country where at least half the country no longer has faith in the judiciary branch. You're going to have the other half of the country having no faith in the election process. And that's a bad thing. And the problem is, if you look at the four options, I think there's a good chance that four won't be the one that the Supreme Court follows. I'm not saying there's no case that they will, but I think there's going to be a lot of pressure not to go that far. So what we're going to end up with, with this is over. Not only will half the country be pissed off, they'll have lost faith in the electoral process with no faith for future elections as a remedy to what they saw in 2020. Not only is that bad, it's dangerous. Let me preface this. I don't mean to compare Confederacy to Republicans and conservatives today. I'm looking at this as a political process. But you have to understand one of the reasons, one of the main reasons, the southern states left the Union in 1860 was because they knew that the political balance in this country had been lost. And as bad as things were in 1860, there was no prospect of them getting any better in future elections. The Republican Party hadn't existed until 1854. It had come out of nowhere. And in a series of elections, 54, 56, 58, and 60, Republicans had taken the House, taken the Senate, and taken the White House. What, in many ways, 1860, the election of 1860 was a political revolution. Because before 1860, there had always been efforts to maintain a balance. Because of the way the Republican system is set up, small r, and our electoral system, the Electoral College, uh, the state representation at the Senate instead of populist representation, the Democrats knew they had a chance in the Electoral College and to hold on to the Senate to block anything you know, revolutionary that the Northerners might try. They knew they, were, they had lost the House early on. You had mass immigration coming into the country because of location of ports. Most of it went into the north because of the railroads. They moved from there west, but to the northwest and across the country. So the population in the north was surging, not so the population of the south. So in the House of Representatives, the north just kept getting proportionally stronger and stronger and stronger. And the south knew that. But in the Senate, which was based on states, as long as you could bring in a free state and a slave state to balance one another, you could maintain a balance in the Senate, and in the Senate, Southerners could block any legislative action coming out of the House. And of course, the way the Electoral College was, they would have a better than even chance that they had the Senate to, you know, hold on, or not so much a better than even chance, but a good chance of holding on, at least periodically, to the White House, which they had been able to do. I mean, the election before uh, uh, Lincoln, 1856, a Democrat had been elected who was a Northern Democrat, but he didn't want to do anything about slavery. But in 1860, when the Republicans had taken the Senate, and after the Mexican War, you had all these new states that were going to come in out West, Midwest, for prospects of maintaining a balance between free and slave states in the Senate was disappearing. So it wasn't just that by 1860, 
the Southerners had lost you know, control of all branches of government. The Democrats had lost control of all branches of government, be they North or, Northern or Southern Democrats. But there was no prospect for that to reverse itself in the future. The trends going back to 1854 were running one way. What that meant after 1860, this is, you know, and the Southerners understood this, that they either would have to ultimately give up slavery, change their entire society and how it operated, or leave the Union. There was no longer an electoral chance to balance what was going on. I mean, the election of 1860, you had three Democrats running under various titles, pushing different versions of a Democrat agenda, running against one Republican. Lincoln got 40% of the vote. The Democrats got 60% of the vote. Remember how you know, the Hillary Clinton supporters were so upset because she got 3% or 2.1% more votes of a popular vote than Trump, and she stalled the election? Imagine getting 60% of a popular vote and losing the election. Because that was the situ situation Democrats, and especially Southern Democrats, were in in 1860. And there was no prospect in sight that that was going to change in any meaningful way. So what did they do? They left. Now, I don't mean to imply, you know, conservatives are going to start leaving, you know, pulling out of a union. Red states are going to start leaving. I'm not going to go that far. But if you place the red states, the red counties, Republicans, conservatives, in a position as a result of Supreme Court, a Supreme Court case where they believe that the electoral system will not give them a chance to correct whatever happened in 2020, what's the point? You know, I made, posted a video a long time ago. Why are we still a country? And I posited that the things holding us together were inertia and habit. All the other institutions and concepts and ideas that provided a consensus to hold this country together have been destroyed. They're gone. Basically, what keeps us together today is inertia and habit. It's going to be hard to break up, even harder than it was in 1860, because the divide isn't geographic the way it was. It's geographic in a sense, but not, you know, where you could just delineate this part of the country as one side, this part as the other. It's not, doesn't work like that. You know, if you look at Pennsylvania, you've got these blue dots on the sea of red. And that's true of, of many states. I don't know how you break apart in a situation like that. So it's basically inertia and habit that's holding us together. But we can't keep doing things in this country that further destroy the consensus, what little of it exists. And now what we're looking at, the prospect of doing something that would take half the country, the red half, basically, and say to it, you're never going to win another election, at least at the national level. You'll never win the presidency. You're never going to win the House. You're never going to get the Senate after we get done taking it. Because we will just continue to I mean, vote for it. But remember, if the Supreme Court, whatever the Supreme Court does, it doesn't matter what it decides, whatever it decides will set precedent. If the Supreme Court sets the precedent that we're not going to interfere with the states and how they do elections, then blue states can do pretty much what they want as long as they don't look like they're, you know, conspiring to deprive people of civil rights by doing something like that. But voter fraud, while it does deprive people of, of civil rights, isn't as visible as something, you know, a, a, a test you give to, to voters that only white people, you know, can get right. So, so you suppress the black vote. Or if you put, you know, Supreme Court would chop that down. Or if you set, you know, voting sites only in white neighborhoods, they, they'd put that down. But you start committing voter fraud especially in urban areas where, you know, you start talking about civil rights and every vote should count and use that as cover, 
and you just keep committing election fraud because basically the Supreme Court has set a precedent which allows you to do that. Because if you do that, they're not going to do anything. And that's, that's the problem the court faces. Whatever, if they don't do something, they're setting a precedent, which will itself make it more difficult to stop it in the future and will require a reversal of that precedent to do anything, which is not likely to happen. So this is, this is going to be a really dangerous time for this country, much like the election of 1860 was. Lincoln was elected in November. States started leaving in December. Again, I'm not predicting red states start pulling out of the Union, at least not that quickly. But it's not inconceivable. I mean, at some point, we can't keep going down this road where we continue to destroy whatever's left of a consensus in this country. And now we may very well tell half the population that you can't trust the judiciary and tell the other half you can't trust the judiciary and then tell the Republican half, because of our actions, you're likely, the same thing's likely to happen in 2022, 2024, 2026. You know, I, I was born in Philadelphia. We had a Republican mayor the day I was born. A few days later, the Democrats took over the city. They've never lost control. My entire life, they've maintained control of the city of Philadelphia. I'm not saying that they, they only did it through fraud. But the way their politics works, they get in, you never get them out. You know, Atlanta, Georgia, the last Republican mayor was in the 1870s or 1880s. You know, when the Democrats got control of Atlanta in the 19th century, that's two centuries ago now, they never gave it up. Last mayor of all these cities, you know, 73, 50, 40s, 30s. We see it all the time. And if they're allowed to do at national level what they've done at the municipal level, what hope is there for people who live in red areas? And that's the danger. And it, it's, it's real. And... We should all be praying for the members of the Supreme Court, because if they, no matter what they do, it's going to be bad. But if they can choose very poorly and make a very poor decision that in retrospect may end up being perceived as the equivalent of a Dred Scott case, which helped propel this country towards civil war. That's what I think. Leave a comment. Let me know what you think. You like this video? Give it a thumbs up. Didn't? Give it a thumbs down. Subscribe to the channel. Uh, hit the notification button so you know when I post new videos. Share the video with your friends. And until the next time, don't give up. Keep fighting.